everybody, welcome back to Pagan's Witchy Corner. My name is Pagan, and today I'm joined by a familiar voice that you have heard before on the podcast, but I haven't spoken to in a while, and that is author Ryan Smith. Uh, Ryan is the author of The Way of Fire and Ice, and his newest book that's coming out in just a few days is Spinning Weird, which is so good. I can't wait to talk about it, but Ryan, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me back on. It's great to be here. So I, when you announced book two was probably like a month or so after we talked last time and it was just early pre-production of the book and I know you announced it in your Discord and I was so excited for it and I've been excited and chomping at the bit to finally get a copy of it, finally got a copy, read the whole thing in like, I don't know, like four hours. <laughs> so it was so, so good had so many different topics that I was not expecting, which was super cool. And I definitely want to talk all about it. But obviously, what was kind of your inspiration from obviously the transition, which was, you know, the way of fire and ice was talking about uh, heathenry and how to bring it into a modern modern practice and escape the fascist roots of it. Um, well, the fascist modern roots, I should say it doesn't actually have fascist roots but uh and escape those things and then moving into the more i guess you could say mysterious practices of it into this book so what was kind of the transitional process for you a big part of it for me was when i wrote um the way of fire and ice like a thing that was sort of like always floating in the back of my head is that like each chapter of this could easily be a book in length um there's like it it would be incredibly easy for example to like you know write a whole book about the gods um because yes. <laughs> there's so much out there um <laughs> so like that was always something that was kind of in my head while I was writing The Way of Fire and Ice um and I felt that it's important to get into the cosmology stuff first because that is something that I think is even more important than we have many gods and they happen to be these ones that pop culture identifies with the Vikings, um, <laughs> that it's a whole system yeah. of approaching reality and a whole way of thinking about things that, and, and, you know, folks talk a lot about that in heathen spaces. It's like, it's definitely a thing that's all out there, but I think it's, you know, it's something that needs to be more clearly discussed as well as what does this all mean to live in a world that's an animistic world. That's one where death isn't you know the end it's just an end um and all of our actions are connected to everything else like and just thinking about what that means for us and part of that's also talking about the like some of these more mystical practices of things like death related mysticism um getting into more depth on odisetta um because these are things that i think are also like important to get into in practice like save mm -hmm. is not just like because folks will call it like, you know, um, Norse witchcraft or something like that, which is a good shorthand. Um, but what I like to think of it even more as, um, and also generally when we're talking about things like folk magic and ceremonial magic and stuff, is that it's another way of interacting with the world. It's not like just wish fulfillment or like a power fantasy or something like, you know, everywhere in mainstream society says it is. It's another way of relating to what's around us mm -hmm. and a building relationship and creating meaning. So I think it's important to get into that stuff more and also present some arguments for why this stuff is valid. I think it's such a great way that you stitched the book together. And it was interesting because I, I think it was like start of chapter one maybe that you talked about death work and i had just gotten started working like deeply in death work and i'm like huh well that's being called out by the gods chapter one okay <laughs> which was a really fantastic synchronicity which obviously we talk a lot about in the book as well which i thought was so cool i could go on for hours about all the different things that you talked in about in the book that were just honestly in such integral parts of the Norse practice that really aren't talked about. I mean, obviously it's like we should honor the gods and we should do the things and, you know, practice heathenry, but it's like, how, 
how do you do that without and nobody really you know in social media is really explaining that outside of you know maybe doing a couple of the um ceremonies but mostly it's just do the thing be a heathen ta-da you're done that's it worship the old gods ta-da you're done that's it and yours really breaks it down and i found a lot of interesting correlations and i don't know if you've read um matthew ash mccann's book uh weird craft if you haven't i highly recommend it but i found a lot you, of you know what's interesting is i read that one just after i finished um, <laughs> really <laughs> writing this one um <laughs> Ash is such a cool dude as well. I love talking to Ash. And there were so many awesome correlations between your book and his that it's like, well, here's the textbook set on how to do this. Congratulations, you both have written them. <laughs> That's what it was like. It was such a really fun correlation to see all of that. And I loved his book and I obviously loved yours. And I think that probably my favorite thing in your book was talking about the different ways that we can work within the animistic practices but also doing the spirit work that comes with that as well which just was right up my alley and so cool i'm so glad you touched on it in the book it was so good oh my gosh i could just like be a happy little fangirl about your book all day long <laughs> um but let's talk a little bit about uh what I'm going to have to edit this pause out. <laughs> I lost my train of thought for a second. Uh, let's talk a little about uh, Sade and kind of what your practice, kind of how that influenced the writing of the book. Sure. Um, so the way I describe Sade, and I want to stress that this is the particular take I have and is also what has been sort of developing within uh, the fire and ice uh, spaces mm -hmm. um, is our own particular thing. Um, so I'm not claiming, I want to be upfront that this is a thing that's a modern practice. This is a thing that is derived from these historical sources, but I'm not claiming that this is, you know, long lost ancient Nordic wisdom that has been uncovered in a secret grimoire or handed down by a family line or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, like, what what it is we're doing is something that has been developed by looking at what people did and also looking at other examples of folk magic. And it's based on that that I see save as something that is a way of interacting with the world. It's another way of learning things about the world around you, of influencing um, outcomes and influencing actions and possibilities. It's something that is a more like direct manifestation of uh, how everything is connected through weird and yes. it's reaching into those connections and saying let's do something with this like it's a very like like a way i like to explain it when i'm teaching save is that it's as far as like the logic of the like the most like you know the sorceress parts of it like the where you do workings to cause things to happen part is it's sort of like a you could almost call it like a quantum physics kind of magic of it's not like using specific elements or specific things that exist within the world it's grabbing on to like the fundamental force of all reality and tweaking it a bit mm -hmm. um moving the threads yeah, exactly. It's rearranging things slightly. And that also, you know, leads to unexpected outcomes, because when you twist one thread, it twists other threads. Um, when you cut one thread, other threads are going to cut loose as well, and so on. Um, and it's not something that I see as supernatural. It's just another way of being in the world. And it's another way of processing and interacting with the stuff that's around you. And that's also why when I talk about save, I like to lay it out as something that's sort of on a spectrum from, well, here's a really mundane reason why this is something that's still valid. And then here's for on the other end of where you accept the metaphysics as being what they are that, you know, even on the most mundane level, like making like a hex or something around somebody who is causing harm to you in the world may not necessarily directly do something about them if you you know see this as just like a thing you do 
um, and not as magic. But it could at least be extremely cathartic and help you work through what your feelings are around that person. Um, and as far as say that self and how it's done, at least within the practice I'm talking about and what's in the books, it's divided into sort of three sub disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, what we've been kind of talking about the most so far has been uh, the sorcery, what's referred to as sorcery or witchcraft or direct workings, uh, save magic of where you do a work, a folk magical working to cause something to happen. And this could be something like drawing a sigil or um, using like, you know, principles of sympathy um, and connection to do a working on a particular person, you know, stuff like that. Um, the other two disciplines are utiseta, which Spinning Weird gets into a lot more detail about that. Mm -hmm. um, which is like a form of trance meditation and journey work um, that allow that gives you the tools to sort of slip between the worlds and travel between the nine worlds, as well as interact with the powers in a different way than you usually do. Um, and the last, which is not in this book, but, you know, is something that is it, uh, also sort of mentioned in the way of fire and ice is spay, which is possessory work. Mm -hmm. Um that's something that, you know, I feel very strongly that that's something that should be taught by, you know, in person or by people who are like there and on hand. And it's worth having people know about it through things like books and online sources. But I wouldn't feel good about like, say, putting out a how-to manual on how to do spay. Um, yeah. <laughs> is that, that yeah. <laughs> Possessory work is really easy to get really, really wrong. Um Yes. It is definitely one of those things, and it's one of those things that I've started to also get really deeply into, especially with the death work that I've been doing. Um, but I also have a crew of people that are around to make sure that I don't go too deep, that I'm, you know, safe, that I'm comfortable, that everything is working the way that it's supposed to. And because, yeah, going deep into those kind of channeling sessions can ultimately be dangerous. Um, in some ways. And so making sure that you have the right tools and other people around, obviously, to help with that are really important. Oh, yeah. Like, this is not something you want to do solo. No. And it's not something that I would say if you're a beginner, please don't start with that. <laughs> please, no. please, please, please don't start <laughs> with that. Learn all the other stuff first and then uh, find a teacher who can help you with that because that's not something that you should be really trying to reach out on your own you should be having someone help with that um and because ultimately it can go very very wrong because you have to make sure you're connecting to the right sources kind of thing um so i think that that's a really uh great way to put that and obviously talking about it and having people understand what it is but also not giving them the how to do this and then here's a manual is probably the safest option but i love the trance and journey work that you mentioned in the book because that's probably one of my favorite parts of sade and doing all the work with it and um i love following the lines of weird through the meditations and seeing where i need to go and what i'm going to connect with and using it to connect with the deities and other beings of the nine worlds and all that. It's just a really fun and almost interactive kind of form that you get to take part in. Um, and obviously the, you know, nitty gritty, here's how you do the, I would say, the more hands-on approach um, with the sigil work and the actual witchcraft work and the sorcery. Um, those are always good because you get to do, kind of get your hands dirty, but doing the, the trance work is probably my favorite thing in the world to do because I just enjoy it so much. And it also comes very easy for me. So and I like writing and teaching about it too, because it's very, it's once you get the hang of it, it's something you can do almost anywhere mm -hmm. with, and all you need is yourself. Exactly. Exactly. So another topic that you mentioned in the book that we've talked, you know, briefly about is you did mention it several different times throughout the book. What was your importance of putting death work and the topics of it in the book? Because it's not readily talked about. 
it is briefly in other books, but it's not really talked about. And I, I feel like you broke it down very nicely in the book. So what was kind of your, your thought process on why should that be included? I think what's important about including death work is that it's, I see it as an extension of what people do with, you know, other forms of working with the dead of like, whether you're doing stuff and blow or you're maintaining like an ancestor shrine or something like that, um, that this is the next step out. And it, it makes like, it's something that I know in, other in some other magical systems it's seen as much more like some pretty serious and heavy stuff um that requires a lot of preparation like i personally think that like the more significant preparation you need to do for doing death work is more on the psychological end mm -hmm. of you know if there's a particular dead person that has done you significant trauma then no please do not interact with them while you're doing death work because you know let's not re-traumatize ourselves please <laughs> um <laughs> But like, uh, it, like kind of more in that direction because it's that there just is this sense of permeability that's in the source material between the worlds of the living and the worlds of the dead, and there isn't like there certainly is like you know there's a sense of process of you know Balder can't come back until after Ragnarok, for example. Um, or except by extraordinary measures of getting all things in the nine worlds to weep for Balder. Um, but even though there is that sort of, you know, once something dies, it's dead, the dead can still be something that's in with the living. Mm -hmm. And we've also been sort of like, you know, in a very like practical sense, we've been through a time that has been reminding us a lot about our mortality. Yes. And I think there's a lot of folks that are thinking about that more. Like I, I, like for me in classes, I've had people like asking about like specifically getting more into this stuff. So I think that, you know, the whole thing of the pandemic has also just awakened a need of, we need some way of working with this thing because death has just gotten a lot closer to a lot of people in a big way. And there is, and I think that it's important to get a something that's more of a healthy view of death because in society we do have a very um and like Christopher Hughes gets into this in incredible detail because you know he was like ran a mortuary like was like mm -hmm. a mortuary technician and ran like mortuary service in North Wales for a while. So death is a thing he knows. Um and I recommend reading his stuff on it in more detail. But like generally, and there's something he gets into as well, that generally speaking, the way our society deals with death is very closed off and also very fearful Yes. of like treating it as something that it's to be delayed, it's to be denied as much as possible. And then when it happens, um, it like you're whisked away and then we bring back this like um, manicured like body in like a nice clean casket and then we're just going to put you in the ground and that's all there is to it um and it's something that's and, and it's not helped by that like the most dominant religion in at least you know north america is one that says and by the way once you kick it you're going to be finding out whether or not you passed or flunked the biggest test ever um <laughs> that's a great way so, to put that <laughs> you know it is a like it's either that or you die and that's it. So that doesn't really create a good, I think, like relationship with something that is a very natural part of existing. And it's something that we've been especially reminded of lately that and having a relationship with it, that's more, this is another state. And this is, you know, stuff that seems to be in the source material, at least, you know, based on what we have that survives and what have you, um, that, it's just another state of being that the dead still interact with us in some ways. And also when you think about it metaphorically, there's a lot of truth to that as well. Like we are living in a society that in a lot of ways has been strongly shaped by people who have been dead so long, their bones are turning into dust. Mm -hmm. And like, and you don't even have to go back that far, um, like just a couple hundred years. And we're still living um, with like the dead hands of some very powerful people at the tiller of yes. the world we're living in be because of the consequences of their actions. So, you know, even though if you're going to completely go into what you could call a much more secular interpretation of practice, 
it still holds metaphorical truth of that the dead are never really dead because the impact of our actions resonates throughout our lives and beyond. I think that's a really great way to put that because, you know, when it comes to working with any dead, you know, you have obviously what you would call your celebrity dead. Um, and I'm not talking like recent celebrities. I'm talking like people that have been dead for several hundred years that we still talk about over and over and over again. And almost to a degree that, you know, you could go into the philosophical thing of do they actually get rest because we never shut up about them. But at the same time, you know, are they even paying attention to us? So it becomes a very interesting philosophical conversation at that point. But it's something that I agree with you that I think that prior to the pandemic, death was something that was almost sterile. We didn't really talk about it. We would talk about it in a process of grief or a process of basically were you a screw up in life like you said you did you flunk the ultimate test kind of thing and that was it and you didn't really get to have that in-depth conversation of you know what happens and what happens to all of the people that have basically died suddenly we've had a lot of dead in the last several years because of the pandemic and that were completely unexpected and not to say that some people don't die unexpectedly, but it's something that's, as someone who practices death work, understanding that you may have some spirits that come through that are like, no, I'm not dead. I'm in a hospital somewhere. <laughs> oh, no, honey, you died. You died of COVID. Trust me, you died. You're you're dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like, so <laughs> like, it is no, like, it is worth mentioning, you know, it, within, like, the first year of the pandemic, just in the United States, a million people died. Like, a million extra people all, like, basically crowding the gates of the underworld at once is no small thing. Well, the poor, like, death deities were just like, whoa, we got an influx today. I'm sure that they probably were able to handle it just fine. But I could just imagine them going, what is going on on the earthly plane? <laughs> <laughs> just a little overwhelmed by all the dead that came through and that was just american dead that wasn't even the rest of the world um somewhere air was shouting i really tried i really really <laughs> I tried explaining this <laughs> <laughs> poor air oh air she she gets she's my uh deity of my healing altar she gets a workout poor girl <laughs> <laughs> she's like just anecdotally she seems to have become much more significant for she very has. understandable reasons yes she definitely has and i love that um so many people are starting to recognize her as well and that she's no longer i guess you could say a forgotten deity which is really great um to see people going oh, oh yeah hey I, I i work with her now i didn't yeah. know who she was prior to a few years ago but i do now <laughs> You gotta thank Snorri for putting in the implication that all the twelve goddesses he listed after Frigga are Frigg's handmaidens and not, you know, independent goddesses in their own right. Um, right. Yeah. They may have served similarly, I guess you could say, as handmaidens. But I mean, even if you think of handmaidens in a historical concept, they were more than just ladies who followed, you know, the main deity or the main royal person around. You know, they, they had jobs, they had things to do, and they were also protectors. They they basically yeah. kept them alive and all this. It's a really cool co historical thing if you guys want to look it up. But um, yeah. I, I think it's something that history, history has kind of dumbed them down and gone, no, they just followed the woman around. No, they didn't. They did more than mm -hmm. that. Give them some credit. <laughs> and Eric did much more than be Frigg's handmaiden, and she is so much more than that, which I'm so glad that she's finally getting some recognition. Um, but I think that the the death work side of things is also a really important concept as well. And I really love how you touched on everybody going to Valhalla. <laughs> and I say that kindly because there's a whole lot of uh, conversation around that. And oh. there's so much more to Valhalla and all the other death realms that are in just the Norse part of religion if you even look at all the other different pantheons they have their own and it, there's a lot of you know death realms or afterlifes or paradises whatever you want to call them and i think it's funny how a lot of new pagans get hung up on valhalla and there's what i think four if i remember correctly 
I think there's yeah, yeah, four. There's at least four. There's at like, least four. I think there's four main if, ones, and then there's some other ones as well. But um, like, if we don't count each individual god's hall as an additional possible oh, yeah, afterlife, that too. <laughs> that's all. Like, there's definitely sources that imply that may have been a belief, and like, who's to say? I mean, I haven't died. You haven't died. Um, <laughs> we don't. We're not privy to that. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like we we can't like speak with certainty on whether or not that's not a thing too. So <laughs> those doors are locked until after we die, and then we get to I yeah. guess figure out what choice we have or where we end up. So, um, mm -hmm. and I think yeah, that's... like oh, go I ahead. I'm sorry. Valhalla, well, like, I think Valhalla gets the press because it's like it is. It's easy to read as a paradise because it's juxtaposed as one mm -hmm. in the prose edda to an extent. Like, not completely, but it is somewhat. And then it gets really romanticized in, like, the 19th and early 20th centuries. Like, Wagner was definitely a factor in that whole story. Yeah. Um, but I think there's also, like, and again, this is more my read on the source material this is not me saying this is like a scholarly conclusion or something like that um i suspect there's also an element of uh, christian sources playing up valhalla as some kind of warrior's paradise as a way of explaining why for about 200 years these heathen warriors were kicking the snot out of them and sacking holy places and doing stuff that god is not supposed to allow um so i i think there's an element of like and and it's not just in like throughout history there's examples of the people who were on the receiving end of like a an enemy that they saw as particularly powerful and effective tend to find ways to talk them up after mm -hmm. like you know look at any go to any random world war ii forum and you're going to see this with people talking about the germans um yes um for example um and so i think that there might be an element of that in play of some of these sources played it up because it fits within the stereotype about them as the being this warrior people and also because it gives an explanation that's not like it gives an explanation that's not really rooted in any like things that were facts on the ground like you know for example hey maybe these people were good at warfare because they were sailors and being a sailor on a ship powered by oars and like multiple rows of oars and sails means a whole bunch of people have to work as an effective team mm -hmm. i mean if you ever if you've ever been on like you know a little rowing boat with two people <laughs> That takes work. Yeah, I was gonna to say if you don't know how to do that, that's a little bit chaotic, just for the record. So. Oh yeah. So you know, like let, let's say that it's because they have this like idea that also is suspiciously similar to Christianity's concept of you get the martyr's crown if you die in the name of Jesus and go straight to the right hand of God and skip all that judgment stuff. So, you know, um, like I think there might have been an element of misunderstanding and playing it up and misapplication of something that wasn't quite what the truth was i think i mean truth being relative but i think you know what was most likely the case mm -hmm. um and you know that also looks really sexy and it's all over the place in pop culture like that is the pop culture image of the viking is oh, yeah this like bloodthirsty warrior that is seeking like glorious death in battle like it even shows up in star trek with the klingons so mm -hmm. it really does and um i think that it's something that a lot of people also don't talk about hell's realm and literally going to her realm and being in helheim and all of that it, it's not a it's not because you were bad <laughs> Not like literally oh. the the pagans version or the Norse pagans version of you're going to hell like the you know good Christian folk like to say um, down here in the south, um, but <laughs> you know I think that it's something that we should definitely be talking about because it is something that is a place of rest, and I don't know about y'all but I wouldn't mind going there because this life just the last three years have been a little bit hard and i would like some rest <laughs> so if that's where i end up i would not be disappointed at all <laughs> and, and you know what when the gods made 
like Asgard, it specifically says in the Voluspo that they basically didn't have to work and everybody had enough gold and could just sit around and make stuff and play games. So, you know, that being an afterlife doesn't sound so bad because Helheim's not much different from, no. oh, well, you get to sit around and hang out with people and not do anything. Okay. I, I wouldn't mind that. I mean, also, if Loki has a realm, I wouldn't mind going there either. I think that would be entertaining. Definitely. It, um, it would never be boring. No, um. life with Loki is never boring, ever. <laughs> that is very true. Um, Loki and I have had some interesting experiences the last couple of months because uh, I didn't give him enough attention. And so he kept getting my attention by sending me snakes in my house. Mm. Oh, well, that's fun. Yeah. They weren't poisonous. They were, you know, nice, friendly snakes. But I'm like, dude, really? And yeah. So that was kind of his way of saying, hi, pay me some attention, please. Hi, did you forget about me? Yeah, no, I didn't forget about you. I've just been busy, dude. That's all. Stop sending me snakes. <laughs> that's his thing, though. He doesn't send me any of the other things that that's our thing. So he's always, when he really wants my attention, I get a snake. So it's a good time. I'm not mean to the snakes, just for the record. I try to rehome them back outside as easily as possible. And the last one we did. So it was a nice little chicken snake that found its way back into the woods. But it tried to come in through my window. That was not fun. Oh, that, that is a problem. Um, uh, that, that is the whole boundaries thing. Um, yeah, just a little bit, a little bit. And... <laughs> It was a really funny morning because I was sitting there having coffee with my daughter and my husband. My daughter looks up and she goes, there's a snake in the window. Just calm as can be. And I'm like, what? And of course, I go scrambling off the couch because I'm like thinking it's about to touch me. And nope, it was caught between the window insulation and the window. And my husband's like, well, this is going to be an easy snake to catch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good times with Loki. Love it. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I think that having the conversation about all the different realms is always important because while we do love Valhalla, I think it's also important that it doesn't get all the airtime. Yeah. So. Like, and there is a general tendency of the different death realms within the Nordic space of what puts you there with one noteworthy exception is how you die. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not a judgment on. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say it's not a judgment. It's it's a consequence of the life you've lived. It's yes. not a, you did good, you did bad. It's you led a violent life, so therefore it's not surprising you died a violent death. You were somebody who worked a lot at sea, or you know maybe it's a freak accident. So to die at sea sort of fits with that. And you know for most people, it's going to be like illness or old age or something else that gets us. Mm -hmm. So... You know, it makes sense that most of us are going to wind up in Helheim, and there's nothing about where you wind up that really is a judgment on anything. And I think that's a really important. I mean, except message. the one exception, but yeah, except um. for that one exception, um, which you know is the the world tree uh, serpent that devours the roots of the tree, and you might end up in front of him, maybe. Yeah, and that's I, you have to do really bad things apparently to end up there. Yeah, that's like you have to do stuff that for them would have been like the worst of the worst. So it's kind of more like, like I like I, and I think I hinted this. I get at this a little bit in the book. Um, mm -hmm. I suspect that the lack of a figure sitting in judgment, who's the one that says you're going to go feed need hog like there isn't there is not somebody who does that. There is no like St. Peter at the pearly gates or something like that. Um I believe what that might suggest is that the people who wind up there, it's not so much because some cosmic law has said you broke this rule and therefore this is what you get. And it may be more that the dead and the other realms were like, no, nah, we're not going to have you. <laughs> we do not want you around here. <laughs> You are not welcome in this neighborhood. <laughs> like, like exile by the community was like a thing in nordic societies so it would fit for the community of the dead to be like no you are actually a scumbag yeah 
No, I, I get that. And I think he would have to be really bad for everybody to go, nah, no, no. Yeah, Try a different like... realm, not here. And if you get evicted from all the other realms and that's where you end up, I don't want to know what you did in your actual life. Like, whew, no. That's got to be like <laughs> crimes against humanity, like covering up climate change kind of stuff, you know? I think it may be that or worse. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm totally not making a reference to certain things Exxon Mobil has done for 40 years, but um, you know, yeah, <laughs> all all of that is just absolutely terrible. Um, so what's on the horizon for you? What do we got more books in the series happening? Are we? Are you planning a different kind of book series? Are you planning on writing any more books at all? Like what? What's in the future for Ryan? Um, I've got some book ideas floating around. Um, for now, the bigger stuff that's sort of like immediately on the horizon is continuing to offer classes in fire and ice practice and stuff like Sathe and rune work and other such things. Um, like other stuff so that people can go out and make their own practice and build like community and make this stuff happen. Um, and also um getting like the community as it's developed so far into more of a space that we're able to better support each other um like not just in the sense of hey let's all get together for ritual but also like hey um i'm short on rent this month and i need help or hey do folks know like a good place where i could find like an affordable apartment or is someone at your work hiring you know just like the stuff of like being able to help each other and build that kind of community because i feel like we're where we're where things are going we're going to need more of that like all of us yes. are yes. and a lot more of like those mutual aid groups that popped up in 2020 like I, I think we need to be doing that more um i agree with that and i think that that's kind of a good message for any any pagan of any path going forward i think that no matter what your path is, I think that we should all be on the mindset of we have to help each other going forward because I don't think it's going to get any easier. I think it's going to get a lot no, harder like, and we need to be there for each other. Yeah, especially because I think that, I mean, I don't think, I know, and I'm sure this is going to pick up more. There's a lot of new pagans that are coming into the space. Oh, yes. There's like the, if you could say there's like one thing that consistently drives interest in paganism it is awareness of ecological and environmental issues yes like it's like i don't think it's a coincidence that you've got witchy kind of media that starts popping up as well as interest in witchcraft within you know five six seven years of all of that like early 90s eco media stuff like everything from like you know captain planet which what turned out to be surprisingly nuanced and intelligent in how it developed its villains and portrayed them. Um, and, or like, you know, stuff like um, Princess Mononoke and such. Mm -hmm. um, like, I think there's definitely a connection between that and like the late nineties, early two thousands, like sort of pagan boom that happened. And then the internet helped fuel. And, you know, right now we're living in escalating climate change. So yes, I think that, as that's becoming more of a thing, more people are going to be coming in our direction. And we also know that the folks that have decided that they want to like make queer people not be a thing um, also are probably not going to be fans of us. Nope. At all. Nope. Like, it, in fact, like a lot of them are quite fond of saying that stuff over there is witchcraft or environmentalism is closet earth worship or all i mean i wish environmentalism oh, gosh, was paganism I wish that it, was earth worship um, we'd get so much be, more done <laughs> there'd be so many pagans if that was true oh if only like that's the dream earth worship and environmentalist hand in hand perfect match um <laughs> you know, it, it's just the next step out you want to protect and preserve the earth and living environments well why not worship it i mean it's real exactly it's there. <laughs> yeah you can touch it i promise it does well depending on what you touch might bite you but most of yeah. it won't bite you 
<laughs> but many things won't bite you. Some things might, but you know, they tend to give a pretty good warning of don't but don't touch me, I will bite you. <laughs> That is very true. But no, I think that that is something that is definitely needed. And I, I'm i also seeing that boom as well. And also going forward, for those who are listening to the show, don't go back to the 90s of gatekeeping. Gatekeeping was a big thing in the big pagan boom of the 90s, especially of those who were, you know, elder practices and all of that. Now, I'm saying now I say that to a degree. We did talk about some things that's like, here, we're not going to put this in a how-to manual. And that was the um, deep channeling work because that can't be taught from a book. That's not gatekeeping. That's literally just being like, find somebody to help you because it can't be taught through a book. And the little bits that can be taught through a book are just the very, very tip of that iceberg. So it's not so much gatekeeping in that respect. It's more of you need a teacher to help you. It, but like I like to think of it like it's if the if the way that you would approach that practice is similar to somebody saying, "Hey, I'd like to have, learn how to like do welding out of a book and without gosh. someone in the room." Um <laughs> yeah, don't do know, that. <laughs> Please it, it's don't kind do of that. more like that. It's like <laughs> It's like that. It's like there are some things that you don't want to legitimately throw at somebody new because it's like, here's a welding torch and, you know, a PDF go nuts. Um, No, that's, that's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. um, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> like, here, let me teach you how to use this very extensive chainsaw through a YouTube clip that's only 30 seconds long. That's the equivalency as well. Don't do that. Please. Yeah. <laughs> With no prior knowledge, please don't do that. Um, like, like it is appropriate to be like i'm not going to teach you that because that is legitimately like dangerous or easy to do wrong or could have serious consequences if you screw it up um, yes absolutely now that's not saying that you can't go out and learn it just find somebody heck if you're wanting yeah. to know more about it you can shoot me a message or you can get in contact with ryan we can help put you in the right uh frame of mind with people or connect you with somebody or even connect you individually ourselves I'm sure that we would be happy to help you, but please don't go try to learn that from a book ever. Yeah. Please <laughs> do not end up on a pagan jackass episode. Yeah. Or in, on a crazy witch talk episode of basically it's like, hey, I ended up with seven demons in my house. How? What? Are you, first of all, are you sure they're demons? Secondly, how? <laughs> I have questions. <laughs> Um, usually that's somebody that's like trying to jump into the deep end without doing the introductory work. But that being said, yeah. <laughs> if you're a new pagan or you are an experienced pagan, if you're an experienced pagan, don't gatekeep. It's rude. Don't do that. Yep. Secondly, if you're a new pagan and you're looking for resources, the podcast is full of them. Secondly, reach out to awesome people like myself, like Ryan, pretty much anybody I've ever talked to on the podcast. Um, they will help connect you with the people that you can learn from or you can learn from the resources that are offered there um but yeah and, and like and a lot of pagan authors are really mostly like very like there's a couple of exceptions but most of them are very approachable people and are very cool people like if there's somebody who's like running a channel or writes a book or something that you're interested in and you want clarification like go ahead and go ahead and reach out like mm -hmm. i guarantee there's literally like three people in the entire community who actually live off of their book royalties. Everybody else is like a normal person with a normal job. Yeah. Um, I can think of maybe a handful of people that are like that, but most of them have, you know, other things going on and they're, I would say probably everybody I've ever talked to is approachable. I will say that much. <laughs> so I cannot uh, think of anybody I've ever talked to that was not approachable. Like, I, I think it's safe to say anyone who's, like, ever published a book on paganism in a way that people could buy it was somebody who was interested in sharing what they've got. So, yeah, you know. Definitely. And, like, most likely folks are going to be like, oh, I'm really flattered that you're asking me. Um, you're going to be like, oh, you reached out to me. Oh, you actually read my book. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> most of them kind of tend to freak out and be super excited when you tell them, hey, I read your book and I have questions. 
honestly, most of them are, will be so happy that you just reached out and said, I read your book. Can you help me with X, Y, and Z or point me in a direction of help? Yeah. Like, they're just super excited about it. So, and, and I know speaking for me, like, if you reach out to me and are like, hey, I've got questions about this thing. This thing didn't make sense. I'll be like, yes, let's talk about it. Um, it's always better yeah. to ask questions than try to guess and get something incorrect. Um, or get it just slightly incorrect and then it just screws everything up and you're like, oh, I'm going to just completely turn off working with, you know, paganism because I did this one thing wrong. Don't do that. Just ask questions. <laughs> None of us bite, I promise. <laughs> and, and, you know, pagans generally and also like heathenry specifically, there's no such thing as like you did this thing, therefore you're forever whatever it is that's the horrible thing that happens to you or whatever. Like. Yeah, I was going to say, it's. It, I don't know if you really can screw up with Norse paganism. Maybe like, I mean, a spell or two, but... Like, the only way you could really screw up big time in Norse paganism is you'd have to be a really awful person. Yeah. Or you have to do something <laughs> really, really stupid. And, you know, at least, you know, within the communities I've been in, like, there are going to be people who will be like, you don't want to mess with that kind of working. That's a bad idea. Like there may be multiple people who will be like, maybe you shouldn't do that thing. Um, yes. And are quite happy to be like, that looks dangerous. Please wear a helmet and <laughs> learn how to ride that motorcycle um, <laughs> before you do it. But like, I mean, other than that, like you can always find a way to make amends or make stuff work within reason, yes. as long as you're not, you know, a really horrible person. Don't be a really it, terrible exactly. person. Basically, like, a rule of life is don't be a terrible human. Just don't. Like, it's just that yeah. simple. Uh, So, do you have any events happening that people can come and either do a book signing with you or that you can, they can basically meet you in person? Do you have anything like that happening? Um, Anything that would be happening with that would be announced through uh, on blackwings.com. Perfect. Um, and I, I will definitely be getting something together very soon. Um, part of the challenge I'm facing is that for the first book, I never actually got to do a book tour because of COVID. So this would be my first actual book tour. Um, oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> There's going to be so many great things that I think I'm looking forward to hearing all about all those. And everybody who's listening, uh, make sure you check out the link that will be in the show description. Um, and it will have all of that great information. Uh, I'm assuming also through your website, people can find your social media links, correct? Yes. Um, and you can find me on Facebook, um, Mastodon, and Instagram. I'm quite firmly off Twitter, and my mental health has been very happy for it. So. Right. Woo. As soon as I stop, like, really, like, I still auto post on Twitter, but, like, I don't, I haven't opened the website and. Like, oh, yeah. I don't know, six months. It's been great. I love it. Yeah, I, I left <laughs> before, like, Elon decided that everybody has to read his tweets. And when I read he did that, I was like, well, I feel very good about that decision now. I didn't now. know that. Ew. Gross. Yeah. Like, he, he tweaked the algorithm so that he appears on everybody's timeline. It doesn't matter if you follow him or not. Tell me your vein without telling me your vein. Good Lord. <laughs> it, it's some serious. Somebody wanted to go to all the parties and never did when they were in high school vibes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That that's a thing. Anywho, um, are you ever thinking about joining the TikTok? Oh, uh, I am working on that. Um <laughs> video blogging is definitely not my um forte, but I'm definitely working on the TikTok. The I'm cool thing about out. TikTok is they offer text posts now. So oh, yeah, you, you don't actually have to be on the camera side of it too. So uh, I try not to be on camera if I can keep from it because I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, I do it very rarely, very occasionally. If you follow me on TikTok, you occasionally will see my face, but most of the time you won't. You will see just uh, you know, photo posts or text posts because I don't like the camera stuff. It's not fun for me. Um, yeah. But if you end up on TikTok, definitely let me know and I will give you a follow and all that good stuff. So that'll be great. Everybody who's listening, this has been so much fun talking to Ryan. Please get both of Ryan's books, which is The Way of Fire and Ice and Spinning Weird. Both of them are absolutely top tier, fantastic, best introduction that you could find into Norse paganism. They're the best ways that I could, honestly, they're the ones I would recommend the most for Norse paganism. So 
definitely check those out if you're interested. And Ryan, you got to come back. We're going to have to do it again. It'd be great to be back on. I would love that. So everybody, take care of yourselves, stay safe, and we will talk very soon. Bye-bye, everyone.